I'm Scott Little with Harleysville Bank, and I'm the co-chair of the Architectural and Environmental Committee with the Central Bucks Chamber of Commerce. I'm joined here at Delaware Canal Park with Doug Dolan, the Executive Director of Delaware Canal 21. Welcome, Doug. Well, Scott, nice to be here with Great. you. Great. I'm thrilled with this. I've been looking forward to this conversation all week long so that I can learn more about the canal and what we need to do to keep it viable. So tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, about the canal itself and the history of it and why it's important to the viewers that are watching this video. Terrific. The Delaware Canal is a National Historic Landmark. It was, it's, it was founded in the early part of the 19th century and for nearly a hundred years was a viable part of the commerce and industrial heritage of our region here. It, it was in that early part of the 19th century, the, the conduit for moving large shipments of, of uh, material back and forth up and down the, the, the riverside here. Interestingly, the, the canal eventually, as canals everywhere did, went, uh, went out of business because of the advent of the railroad and things like that. A um, hundred years after its, its birth, it was derelict and fortunately in about a 10 year period was taken over by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, made into a part of their state park system. Um, it, today, the Delaware Canal State Park is one of the premier parks within the, the uh, Commonwealth's uh, park system. Um, and it is an extraordinarily interesting park because it is 60 miles long, touches two counties, and 60 feet wide. It's an extraordinary cultural, natural, and historical resource for our Commonwealth and for our region. So that affects an awful lot of people. So you're the executive director of uh, Delaware Canal 21. Tell me a little bit about the, uh, the creation of the organization and uh, some of the, uh, the goals and some of your accomplishments of the organization so far. You're absolutely right, Scott. The, the Delaware Canal 21 is, is, a, uh, is a relatively new organization that has come onto the scene here, um, less than a decade old. It was founded by a group of people who's seeking to uh, look at preserving the Delaware Canal and looking at it not so much uh, from its, his, his role in the past, but looking at it from the standpoint of the role that it's serving for our communities in the 21st century. Um, what's interesting about this canal is that it is not a static relic to the past, but rather it's a dynamic living resource for today and tomorrow. And in terms of the canal, it is, its impact on the area here is extraordinary in a variety of ways, both as a natural resource, recreational resource, tourist attraction, continuing to be in the 21st century an economic development engine for communities up and down this 60 mile length. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an extraordinary treasure that the realization is it takes more to take care of this unique treasure than what it can be done right now with the existing resources. The founding of Delaware Canal 21 seeks to imagine not that the status quo is the answer, but rather imagine a new paradigm for a different tomorrow for the Delaware Canal. And it was founded by a, a group of very dedicated people, uh, two, two uh, uh, partners in um, Bucks County, uh, Alan Black and Randy Apgard, which were very active in the canal, were part of the inspirational uh, forces that came together to, to work on the canal. They brought together some volunteers, and in fact, they, they even managed to recruit um, a passionate person whose knowledge of the canal is extraordinary. And we're, we're delighted that we have uh, Bill Collins from Simone Collins, who is a volunteer technical advisor on the canal, who's probably got more stories about the Great. canal than anyone else. Um, Fantastic. Well, let's get, let's, partner in the, excellent. let's get Bill in, and we'll, uh, we'll ask him some questions, too. Terrific.
So Doug told us about the importance of the canal and uh, the historical aspect of it. Um, now I'm here with uh, Bill Collins with uh, Simone Collins Landscape Architecture, and he's going to tell us about the how. How do we continue to keep this as a viable canal and water system connected to the Delaware River and the surrounding that's really communities? The, that's really the prime question. And so this canal, like any other canal, is all about water. Um, it's a water system that was built for transportation but it's essentially a water road, and without it, you don't have the road. So um, that was the industry of the past. The industry of the present and future is recreation, at least. And so for recreation, there's the conservation element, there's the water trail element. So keeping water in the canal is really the, the key to maintaining the entire system. Now, that's the, that is. So how do we keep water in the canal? So. If you understand that the canal, where we're standing, was never here before 1831. It was the mountainside, and it was the river, and where the river turns, it hit the mountainside and scoured this part of the river. This was all constructed. The wall was built out into the river. Mm -hmm. This land was created. The towpath was backfilled. The ditch was built, wasn't dug here, and it was lined with clay. And there was enough room where you see River Road for the cars to get through and the construction vehicles. And that's what became our state highway. So this canal is a structure, first line of defense for that river coming around the bend and wanting to hit that mountain. So what are some of the key things that we're going to need to do going forward to preserve the water system? So, so the water was the primary object for the transportation system. When the state took over and made this a recreation system, it became less important. But in reality, it's, it's the most important because the water is actually an agent that keeps the canal liner solid. So it's a clay liner without the water that cracks, leaks happen. And right here where it was built out into the canal, one little leak starts drilling through and the whole canal drains. Or we're a, we're a barrier for the river and the water comes over the canal and it has right here and then scours everything. Down, Takes that clay out. Mm -hmm. yeah. So keeping water in the canal is a buffer when the river comes over and it's also your agent that keeps the canal clay lubricated and solid. Okay. There's an ecology to it too. So going forward, DC 21, what are they looking to do to make this happen? How do we keep water in the canal? Um, well, I've been working with Alan and Randy, friends of the Delaware Canal, the Point Pleasant Community Association since the early 90s. And back then the emphasis was on historically correct and restoring structures, bridges, aqueducts, lock gates, they're really all water structures. They either cross the water or hold the water or convey the water. But the wa if the water isn't in there, they become less meaningful. So we, we have to treat the water as our ecological imperative because it's a habitat, number one. And when the water's not there, all the things that rely on the water can't use the canal, especially the fish. But we also have to understand that this is a collection. This is a collection of water that's come off the watershed from the mountain. And you're going to take a look at the mountain, but it's a significant watershed. It's about 40,000 acres for the 60 miles. And all the water that flows off that either goes into a creek and hits the canal or goes under and flows straight over River Road and into the canal before it eventually goes back out to the river. So. The canal has to be looked at as a diversion from the two rivers, Lehigh and Delaware. It also has to be looked at as a interceptor for local watersheds. And when that happened, it happened from the very beginning, the builders knew that uh, and they accounted for that. But now with, with climate change and stormwater impacts, uh, it's really affecting the canal more and more.
so Bill, you told us about the importance of uh, the river working connection with the canal uh, and with the surrounding community. And, and how does the water actually get into the canal? That's a good question. And you probably have seen it. There's dams in Easton that one diverts the Lehigh River directly into the head of the canal. And there's another wing dam in the river in New Hope that also raises the pool of the river and diverts water. Those are the two primary sources that were originally designed to, to fill up the canal. And then there's the watershed itself. We know we've calculated right now that there's about 40,000 acres along the 60 miles that flows directly into the canal. There are also large tributaries that flow under, but the part that flows into the canal comes off, off the mountainsides mm -hmm. or off people's homes. And then in the case where a river road is between it, the water has to traverse the road. And so you see this wall here and those holes in the wall, they're scuppers that let the storm water mm -hmm. out. And where does it go? It goes right in the canal. So once the canal starts filling up and it can fill up from the, from the uh, rivers, it can fill up from the watersheds locally, sometimes it gets too high. And that isn't that uh, dip in the towpath is an overflow. And it was designed that way by the original builders to let the excess water out, but it can also let high river water in. in. So those are all ways that water can get into the canal. It's a matter of managing it and keeping it there. So as a landscape architect, what's your role within the organization to kind of make sure all these systems work? As a landscape architect, I think the, the canal is an extraordinary historic landmark. Um, it was conceived when there was only five basic building materials. You had wrought iron, you had cast iron, and you had the clay. And so imagine trying to plot a course from Easton to Bristol that could step down and carry the boats in different levels of pools and also have enough water to operate the system. That's how the system was conceived. Great. And so I think telling that story is part of what we do. Great. Thank you, Bill. Okay. This sheer mountainside is part of the watershed and it was cut over eons by the river. The canal wasn't here and the canal was all built out from that into the river. Where the river bends around towards Philadelphia, it hits this mountainside. And so you can see the canal was built out from the mountainside into the river. These walls were human created and everything here we're standing on was not original land. So straight ahead is an overflow. You can see the towpath dipped down. That was in cases where the canal was overfilled, it would flow back into the river, but it also can let water into the canal when the river is high. So it works both ways. And the wall on the left is one of the structural walls built originally for the canal and then rebuilt later. I want to thank Doug and Bill for their time today and telling us all about the Delaware Canal and Delaware Canal 21. I want to give Doug the opportunity to wrap us up today and tell us this canal spans two counties and 18 communities. What can our viewers do uh, to help the organization? Well, thank you, first of all, Scott, for, for, uh, for making this possible today. Your viewers can really help us out by, one, going to our website, DelawareCanal21.org, learning more about our organization, about our projects that we've been doing about the canal. Um, and also, we've got a major project that we're rolling out right now that's really working in partnership with the, the state of Pennsylvania through its Bureau of State Parks, the two counties, Bucks and Northampton County, to really wrestle with looking at the status quo of the canal and imagining what a new paradigm might be for the future of this canal. It's, it's a groundbreaking initiative with the partners involved, and it's really important. So again, you can learn more about that on the website there. And, and lastly, what I would say is, you know, to, that everyone takes the canal for granted. And if you've got viewers who have never been to the Delaware Canal, who haven't been to the Delaware Canal for a while, I urge you, just go out, take an afternoon, pick a spot. It's 60 miles long. There's a place that's close to you, whether you're in Quakertown or Bristol or New Hope or Easton. Just go out and enjoy the canal. 
look at what it, people are enjoying it and look at what it means for our communities. It's an extraordinary treasure that's posed on a new dynamic life for the 21st century that Delaware Canal 21 wishes you to be a part of. Great. You heard him. Come on out, check out the canal. On behalf of Doug, Bill, and myself and the Central Box Chamber of Commerce and the Architectural Environmental Committee, I want to thank you, the viewer, uh, for watching our video.